friends, welcome to another episode of the 10 Laws Podcast with East Forest. I'm East Forest, coming to you today from southern Utah. I'm in the tiny house. Recording this intro, Rod and I came down here for, well, let's see, about a week and a half, two weeks before she's got to get back, and I'm busy as a bee in the studio down here. I was trying to remember the name of it. They changed the name of the studio. I think it's Grand Staircase now. But it's the music studio that's at the Boulder Mountain Guest Ranch. And I'm summing the final mixes of this new studio LP that comes out this winter. Pretty excited about it. But there actually is a new release coming out this Friday, September 18th. And that is the Ram Dass Instrumentals. So it's an instrumental version of the Ram Dass album, and it's it's really just an opportunity, I thought, to highlight all the amazing musicians that played on the record. There's so many, so I just wanted to have the ability to put that out, and I thought you might that <laughs> thought you might enjoy that too. I can't speak right now. I was just exercising outside, doing some stretching, and I I don't know why I didn't take a break, but here I am, out of breath. Um, yeah. So anyway, we have a wonderful conversation this week with Julie Holland, MD. Julie's been on the podcast before and I wanted to have her back because she's awesome and she is a friend of the family and has a new book out that's really interesting called Good Chemistry. So we get into all things good and chemistry and otherwise. And I just want to say thank you for giving the podcast a review a couple of you did that in the last week. Thank you, Sean Rulon. I see your your uh, review. Thanks for doing that. Appreciate it. Five stars on the uh, iTunes podcast thingamajob makes a big difference. And sharing it on the social media, you can always send your messages to team at eastforest.org. And we have a little bit of a heavy heart because there's so much going on with all the fires and there's, you know, the place I grew up in Salem, Oregon, where my parents are and my sisters and my nieces and nephew is just like unfathomably bad air right now. You know, air index is like 600. I've seen it at times. So my heart goes out to them and uh, just all this intense change we're going through. I know we're in for a lot more. I really feel that in my heart and I I think you can kind of see it on paper, so to speak, too. So uh, keep tapping into that warrior energy. Keep breathing. Keep staying present because we need you right now. You are needed, and you're needed to be here right now with clarity, compassion, and strength. All right, folks, let's get into this great conversation with Julie Holland. Well, thanks so much for for doing this again. It was exciting to see that you had a new workout, which I'm holding here in my hands, and um, it's a really beautiful book. Thank you. <laughs> I'm glad you like it. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I like <laughs> beyond the content. I get kind of into design stuff. I like the size, and I also like the font, and I like the paper. It's so. funny. Yeah, I, I mean, I too really care about those things. And um, this is my fifth book, and I wanted it to be sort of the smallest and the shortest. I didn't want people to feel uh, intimidated and, you know, not want to pick it up and not want to read it. And unlike the pop book or the ecstasy book, which are really sort of books you can dip in and out and just read what you want, this is a book I really wanted people to read start to finish. Yeah, it's well, it's pretty elegant the way you did the chapters, too. I thought that was really beautiful, from the self to the cosmos in only six chapters. Yeah, well, um, it's, it no, it's clean. Out, it's nice. I like. Yeah. I know. I'm. Probably, I'm sure. That, but however you ended up like right. that, it's it's really pretty. It's right. beautiful. Well, I, I mean, actually, the you know the one idea that did did sort of persist from beginning to end was this idea that it was going to be uh, one person connecting with oneself, and then connection between two people, and then family. Uh, and then community, nature, cosmos. That that was always a design that sort of kept throughout. Um, right. And it, I did. I wanted it to be clean. I wanted it to be easy to get through. You know, I I wanted it to be somewhat of a page turner. Um, some, you know, I read a lot of nonfiction books. So many nonfiction books. Mm-hmm. And and I'm and I skim. You know, I don't read every mm-hmm. word. I often just mm-hmm. kind of skim it to get the idea because there isn't 
sort of a through line or a story. Um, and it was really important to my publisher, actually, probably more than anyone else, uh, that there be a through line and a hook and a story and, and you know, that it wasn't just sort of uh, that each, each chapter could stand on itself. She really wanted something that went more through. This was a really challenging book for me. Out of, out of all mm. the books that I've written, this by far was sort of the hardest to get out of me to sort of extricate from my brain onto the page. Um, and I and I actually ended up working uh, with a couple different like editors and co-writers and just other people who were really helping me uh, mold it in, into something. So it was harder. This book was harder. And I, I hope that people like it more because it was more work for me. Right. Do you, do you think that process, that creative process, feeling like a struggle for, for you had anything to do with the content itself? Because it's a, it's a book a lot about connection, socialness, uh, this, this parasympathetic idea. And here we are, this was before COVID when you wrote it, but nonetheless, is there something about yourself that, that you know, there's like a grist there or a friction? Well, I think it's funny because when I, I had a lot of notes and a lot of writing and when I put everything together, I saw that I had a few blind spots, you know, where I really hadn't written very much and where I needed more, um, a, a little bit with the couple and a lot with family. Um, and I, I really mm -hmm. had to, you know, it's very easy for me to write about my own pregnancy and my, and being a parent. And what's harder for me to really get to are sort of the, the childhood dramas and, you know, my childhood connections or disconnections. And I think it's probably still missing a bit from the book, I would say. But I, I don't, the, the content was tougher. I was going around in circles. You know, I really wanted a unified theory. I wanted, I really wanted some simplicity in, you know, disconnection makes us feel bad. Connection makes us feel good. Like very basic sort of black right. and white. You know, psychiatry is so gray. There's like ash gray and charcoal gray and everything is very subtle. I wanted things really clear, like open or closed. You know, I mean, the body is not so binary, but I wanted people to think about at any given time, are you in fight or flight? Are you closed? Or are you in the flip side of fight or flight, which is called the parasympathetic when you are um, you're open to connection, you're open to socializing, you are trusting, you're willing to bond and cooperate. Um, and I, uh, you know, even now, uh, there are uh, times where I'm just sort of paying attention to my body and like, am I in fight or flight or am I in parasympathetic? You know, am I open or am I closed? Um, am I trusting and bonding or am I sort of paranoid and suspicious and shut down? And I, and I keep sort of checking for myself and I look at see how other people are and you could see how politicians are, or, uh, the mayor, anything, you know, just the way they're talking, like, are they opened up <laughs> and are they ready for, you know, compassion and, uh, being social and like, dare I say, sort of socialism and, you know, making sure everybody has enough or are you in this, you know, I got mine and you have to get, to get yeah. yours and yeah, I'm going to mm -hmm. protect me and, you know, and my kin and kind of screw you. Um, and, and I do talk quite a bit about politics and good chemistry. You know, there's a chapter where I talk about connections within society. And I do get into this sort of uh, left versus right um, in terms of uh, are, you, are you open to sharing or are you sort of shut down and, you know, you've got yours and you want somebody else to go ahead and get theirs and you're not going to be sharing your stuff with other people. So it is sort of like this uh, socialism versus capitalism in very broad strokes. Yeah, and there's also uh, a vulnerability to recognize that beliefs that you hold are things that you're just holding on to, and that if you're going to let go of those and pick up something else, we have an identification with that. So I think that, you know, it exacerbates that polarization, and, you know, it, it, there's less connection when it's sort of like you put your feet down, you're like, but this is this is what I identify with, this is who I am, Right, and, and it takes that flexibility. And that, you know, that's sort of where psychedelics come in, right? I mean, one of the things totally. I learned and I, and I wrote about in Good Chemistry is that when you believe something really strongly and you're identified with something <laughs> very strongly, if somebody uh, says, you know, your beliefs are wrong or I don't believe you or something, it's as if they have physically harmed you. Like your brain reacts as if you are physically threatened and you shut down and you go into that fight or flight mode. So with psychedelics... Um, 
there's a little bit less identification, less of being absolutely sure about what you know, and more sort of shaking up your beliefs. Uh, I mean, first of all, you know, when the default mode network gets quieted and this, that's all about your sense of self and who you are and what you stand for. And so when that sort of dissolves, um, you are open to looking at things a different way and being less rigid in your thinking. And, um, so yes, it could apply to politics, but it also, you know, as a psychiatrist, I, when I think about cognitive rigidity, I think about people who have um, obsessive personality styles and very specific obsessive ways of doing things, or maybe um, they've got body image issues or anorexia where they've got very clear, firm beliefs about how things are. Um, you know, I see, uh, or, or addiction, where you get sort of locked into very specific patterns of behavior, right? But then if you can mix it up and shake it up and loosen it up with psychedelics, you have potentially have right. treatment for uh, for addiction or for anorexia or for OCD, you know, things that are really hard to treat in psychiatry. Okay. <clears throat> I want to walk through an analogy here, and uh, here's the preface question. Uh, do you find that for a lot of uh, issues that folks have, there's a, there's a root of some kind of trauma, typically? Usually, look, everybody has trauma. It's broad. broad every, yeah. I would say yes. every single childhood has trauma. You know, the, the metaphor I say is like, you know, even if you were born with a silver spoon in your hand, the of bottom course. line is that like sometimes that spoon was not available or somebody was distracted and poked your eye with the spoon or the food was terrible or the spoon was empty. You know, it doesn't matter. Like every... Every childhood has trauma, and that's relative to your experience. But at some point, no matter how idyllic your upbringing, there were times when your needs were not met, or your needs were disregarded, or you were abandoned. Um, you know, and that was traumatic for you because it's all relative. So everybody has trauma to work out and work through. And I do, you know, uh, I was, you know, I went after med school. I did a psychiatric residency at Mount Sinai for four years, and then after the psych residency at Sinai. Um, I spent nine years uh, uh, running the psychiatric emergency room at Bellevue Hospital on Saturday nights and Sunday nights. So, and I, I wrote a oh, book. Boy. I wrote a book yeah. called Weekends at Bellevue um, about that experience. But what what that taught me, you know, working with really sick people in the hospital in the psychiatric emergency room, what I learned was that every single patient that came through there had this horrible history of childhood trauma. That like the the more they were addicted, the more pain they had. And the pain usually came from childhood trauma. Um, and then mm -hmm. it just got worse from there. So, you know, it, I mean, it got to the point where if somebody was presenting a case to me and they would start to go into the patient's background, I would sort of cut them off and be like, okay, let's just stipulate they had a horrible childhood and move on to the next thing. Because I, right. I don't need to hear the details. I'm sure it was terrible. That's why they're here. You know, like it's a given. So, I mean, I figured out when I started working with, with patients who, were, who had been admitted to the psych ward when I was a medical student, uh, I was just like, oh my gosh, it seems like all my patients, like uh, they've all been raped in their childhood. That's so weird. Like what a coincidence. What are the chances, mm -hmm. you know? And then mm -hmm. I start talking to some few people and they're like, oh no, yeah, that's just, of course, of course they did. But I had never met anybody who had been raped in their childhood before. So, mm -hmm. yes, there's there's no question that in people who have very significant um, psychopathology, some of it comes from childhood trauma. But then the okay. other thing is the chemistry and the pharmacology. And, you know, one out of every hundred people gets schizophrenia. And it doesn't really matter whether they had a good or bad childhood. So right, right. there are exceptions. Right. So if if we think about the times that we're, we're going through now... This is Covidian state. It's it's sort of like it's a kind of rite of passage for a civilization, certainly for our culture, and that's something that seems to be largely missing from modernity. Is this idea that you know, as we grow up, that we go through that that sort of formative, typically something, some kind of rite of passage, and some kind of role that has psychologically in building us into how we move into the future. But what I think about is as we're in this state now. And whether or not we recognize it, I worry about the trauma that it is creating, whether you like it or not. And I'm, I'm tr I want to say trauma without making it pejorative necessarily. Like it's just, you know, it's challenging. All sorts of tough things are going on. But how do we walk through this in the best way, you know, to mitigate as much as we can the negative effects of that in the future? Like how can we use trauma uh, to 
in its most benevolent way? Like, where does the gift in it? Right. Well, I mean, you know, that total cliche about crisis being opportunity, uh, uh, that is really true. Well, cliches have, or yeah, yeah, they, they ring true. For a reason, <laughs> because it's true. So it is, and and even what's happening with with the political upheaval, the systemic racism, the police brutality, um, it's good that it's coming to the forefront because now it's it's all too clear that we really have a problem that we need to address. And nobody can pretend anymore that there isn't a problem. Um, and the analogy that I love to use is like, if you've got some sort of festering wound or an abscess in the body, you don't always know that there's a big bacterial abscess there until it starts to poke out of the skin and the skin gets red and irritated and then there starts to be some pus. And then the the doctor's like, oh, you know, it looks like you got something here and we got to slice it open. And you slice it open and there's just pus oozing out everywhere. And it's like, yep, there was something under there and we got to get it out. And you know, to me, it's like where we are right now in our culture, we are just soaking in pus. Like it's become very clear <laughs> that we've got a terrible infection, that we have to cut it out. We have to dig out this malignancy. And that means getting down deep and getting to the heart of the root of the of the infection and the infestation, you know, and it's, um, you know, there's such a fear of contamination now. Um, you know, one of the good things about COVID, I mean, there's a few silver linings, but yeah. I think, you know, one silver lining is that the entire world is going through this together. And that has really never happened before. You know, there, Absolutely. Like, there's an earthquake in China or there's an outbreak of Ebola in Africa, but it's like not our problem, you know, Ooh, it's terrible for them. But now all of us everywhere are vulnerable and, and dealing with the same risk of contamination um, and certainly not the same outcomes. I mean, there's no question that there's a real discrepancy um, that, that falls within sort of uh, demographics and socioeconomic status of, okay, if you get sick, are you going to survive or not? So it's not, affl- right. it's not afflicting all of us equally. But, but the whole world is going through this, you know, isolation and quarantine and contamination and testing and um, and so that's something good, at least that, you know, you don't have the FOMO of like, uh, well, I missed my prom, but my friends got to go. <laughs> no, nobody, no COVID got, nobody got to yeah. go. So at least that may help with the trauma a little, that it's not just you, that everyone's going through it. But certainly, you know, the trauma is not being distributed equally. Um, the, you know, the frontline healthcare workers, um, it's really hard to lose a patient. And for most doctors, it does not happen that often in your career. Um, but you know, at the height of the epidemic, there were doctors who were signing off on death certificates left and right, you know, multiple people dying every shift, shift in and shift out more dead bodies and, and, and families that you have to tell that their, that their loved ones died. And it's, it's really hard. You know, it's hard, it's hard for all the human reasons you would imagine, but I will tell you, it's also a tremendous narcissistic injury. Um, we don't like to lose, you know, doctors, we're used to getting hundreds on our exams and A's on our tests and, you know, graduating with honors and blah, blah, blah. And like, we, we don't like not knowing the answer, not knowing Mm -hmm. what's going to happen. And we don't like to lose. We don't like to lose patients and we don't like to, you know, be at a loss as to how to help people. So it's a huge trauma for healthcare deliverers, what is happening now. And then for all of us, it's a trauma. And for people who are really paying attention, like, you know, I get especially freaked out at the interaction of, of health policy and, and government, you know, and like, um, you know, uh, our, our current president is really, is is so dangerous for us on so many different levels, you know, like he's a threat to public safety and he's a threat to public health. Um, And so I feel threatened, (laughs) You know, I'm scared. Mm -hmm. I'm afraid people are going to die needlessly, um, whether through police brutality or vigilantes or through um, infection. And um, it's a terrible, it's really bad for your body, you know, to be fearful um, because you're in fight or flight and you don't sleep well, you don't digest your food well, your immune system gets completely screwed up. You know, your whole metabolism is screwy. What you, fight or flight is a very particular state. It's supposed to be only for short periods of time. If you're, you know, being chased by a saber-toothed tiger, um, then you have to run. Or if somebody's attacking you, maybe you have to fight them. So it's like fight or flight. But um, it's only supposed to happen for acute bursts of energy. And then you go back to your normal resting state, which is the parasympathetic state. But what's happening now is we're all afraid. 
um, which puts us in fight or flight. And we're all isolated. And isolation also puts you in fight or flight. You know, we're, we are social primates. We are designed to be social. We are meant to cooperate and to be interdependent. That is our normal default resting state. And that is when we can sleep. We can digest our food. Our immune systems work properly. We can have sex. None of these things really happen very well when you're in fight or flight. So I talk about this a lot in good chemistry, like what it does to the body and how much the complete metabolism and the chronicity and everything, everything gets completely deranged when you are in this chronic state of fight or flight. And that's where we all are right now. So it would seem then <clears throat> to like the antidote to it would be this, these points of connection, like that would be the other polarity, right? Right. Right. So right. when, when you connect and when you bond with somebody or when you trust them or when you feel held and safe and looked after and attended to, that puts you in the parasympathetic state. You know, somebody's holding you, they're hugging you, they're stroking your head. They're saying, I care about you and I'm going to take care of you. And then you can calm down and you feel safe. And that puts you in the parasympathetic. Um, and that's, that again, is where you can rest, digest. And really importantly, that's where the body can repair itself. The body runs a lot of self-repair protocols, sort of mechanisms, but none of those things happen when you're in fight or flight. They only happen in the opposite side and parasympathetic. So, and as much as, as the sympathetic nervous system runs on adrenaline and cortisol, the parasympathetic system runs on oxytocin, which is the hormone of connection and the hormone of trust and bonding and love, um, very high oxytocin states are when you're falling in love, when you're being held, when you're hugging, when you're cuddling, when you're having sex, when you reach orgasm. Those are all really high oxytocin states. The other high oxytocin states are when uh, a mother is nursing a baby. Um, high oxytocin in both the nursing mother and the nursing baby at that time. Um, and then even things like... Um, uh, you know, maybe like the the connection between band members when they're playing music and they're in the in the pocket and they're all kind of playing together and there's a lot of eye contact that can be a high oxytocin state. Or if you're like at a you know a fish concert or something and everybody's dancing to the same music and you're looking around and you feel like fish, you feel like yeah. at one. I was gonna say Grateful Dead because I'm I'm in my mid fifties. It's right? all so good. I'm not yeah, actually to be cool. honest. I'm not really a fish fan. I have to admit it's all um, good. They're great. Guys. But I'm just yeah. saying, like if you're or let's say you're at Burning Man, right? And it's just like this really heady vibe because everybody wants to cooperate and barter and, you know, make friends and get along. And like, that's a big oxytocin festival. So what I talk about in Good Chemistry is that, yes, oxytocin is natural and there's all kinds of ways to induce high oxytocin states in yourself. But the other thing is that there's certain drugs that can mimic these states, that there are some drugs that make you feel held, loved, cared for, safe. Um, and they're pretty varied. Uh, you know, I talk about opiates and, the, you know, the, the overdose epidemic. And, and to me, it's not at all a coincidence that the loneliness epidemic and the opiate epidemic sort of went hand in hand, you know, as people felt more isolated and, and, you know, uh, like if you were a caveman and you were isolated and, and sort of away from the crowd, you were going to get picked off. And like, Either, either you were going to turn into somebody's meal or at least uh, people weren't going to help you build a shelter or help you get food. Like, you know, we needed to cooperate and be part of the tribe uh, back in the day or we weren't going to survive. And so now it still is like this biological reaction that when you are ostracized or isolated, that you feel like you're in danger. So there are some drugs or prescription medicines that mimic this pharmacological state of feeling safe, feeling connected, feeling loved and cared for. Um, and those drugs feel very good to us. And so they have a, a higher tendency to be used repeatedly. So like opiates, um, opiates can make you feel really sort of calm and safe and cared for. And they actually help to put you in that parasympathetic state. Um, and then you have something like MDMA, um, also known as ecstasy or Molly and MDMA acutely increases oxytocin and makes you feel pretty open and willing to bond and trust and connect with people. It's not all yes. it does, but it is one of the things that it does. Yeah. Yeah. And I think what's kind of tough about these days is that physical connection is clearly so difficult yeah. and people turn to electronic means and right. 
Look, the golden rule is and told us all along that if you want to feel held, hold somebody else. If you right. want to feel safe, make someone else feel safe. Right. Um, and so it, it goes into this line of a, a kind of service. Uh, the way to engender these things in yourself is to try to create them in others instead of looking for it to be given to you. Absolutely. And yeah, and that's and that can be tough right now. So I, I really feel for my brothers and sisters that are either single right now or went through a breakup because of the stresses of this these times because it's man having that person to just to hold or have that connection that you feel physically safe with is really powerful when social media on the other hand which I, I don't engage with that much at all on a personal level just on a business level a bit um, it even the last few months has become so strangely toxic and charged and polarized right. that I, I feel that we really are not recognizing the kind of toxicity this is doing to our, the chemistry in our own brains and our psychology. Yeah. You know, it's when, you know, this book was totally written pre-COVID and when COVID happened, I was like, uh-oh, because a lot of the advice in good chemistry is, you know, <laughs> Put down your phone, close your laptop, go outside, be in go nature, on a date. Yeah. <laughs> hug, hug people, have eye contact, you know, hug, cuddle, kiss. Like these are all things that are good for you. And it's like, uh, you know, some of the advice in this book uh, may feel a little bit dated, but on the other hand, it, it's never been truer. You know, this all this stuff Connection, about yeah. how <clears throat> about how you know the more time we spend on our devices, the more miserable we are. Like that is still the case. Um, and the, there's all kinds of problems with social media. And one of the things I talk about in, in, the, in the community chapter, chapter four of Good Chemistry, is that the, you know, the, the seedy sort of underbelly of oxytocin and the, the dirty little secret of oxytocin is it's not totally this like love and roses and unicorns and rainbows, because there is also this issue of social cohesion and sort of groupthink and group identity. Um, mm. That if, you know, the same thing that would make you feel really heady and connected and sort of powerful to be in the group at Burning Man might make somebody else feel that same thing being at a Trump rally. And you have to accept that, that, you know, there is this feeling of, of group cohesion and group identity. And, you know, you're on my side, you're on the other side. Oxytocin is also responsible for that, those kind of discernments. Are you on my team or are you on the other team? So, um, part, you know, we are getting very polarized and, you know, part of it, as we all know, is that the psychopathology of the president, um, is that he is, he is a disruptor and he's comfortable sowing chaos and it works better for him if everybody is divided. <clears throat> and, you know, I, when I was a kid, I always thought divide and conquer, um, was sort of like a scavenger hunt where like, if you give everybody part of the shopping list, then you can get the shopping done faster. Right. It's like, mm. you know, if the three kids all, all take a third of the list, then we divide and conquer, right. We get the shopping done faster, but it turns out that is not divide and conquer. I yeah, was kids, wrong. They pick crappy things. They it's get not the, that. Yeah. But, but divide and conquer really means, um, if, if there's two teams, but, but one of them, it has a lot of infighting, then the other team wins. <laughs> And that's mm -hmm. really like if you the more you can divide the populace so they're arguing against each other, um, the more you've got their vulnerabilities and you're going to win. And, you know, I think um, I think about like my grandfather, uh, who is like a you know, we he escaped from Russia. We're Jewish. He was like a total Zionist. I am not necessarily a Zionist, but he really was. And he it was very important to him about about, you know, Israel surviving. And And the thing he would always say to me is like you know, all the different factions of the Arabs, they all fight with each other. And if they didn't, Israel would be screwed, <laughs> you know? So I, I think about that now with like divide and conquer. And we are, the nation is so polarized. Um, and, you know, it's really important for us to find, find things to connect with. Like, um, uh, I ran into my neighbor the other day and I know that he is, uh, he and I have very, very different politics, but he's my neighbor. He lives a couple doors down and I'm not going to vilify him. You know, he's a good man. Um, I just absolutely disagree with everything politically about him, but, uh, he was going for a bike ride. I was going for a run. I started talking to him about, about, you know, my sore knees and how I didn't used to run, but now I'm using this great CBD cream and he used to be a runner, but he can't run anymore. He has to bike. And I was like, Oh, I'm going to get you some of the CBD cream. It's really going to help your knees. And he's like, yeah, I'd love that. Thanks. 
And, you know, then we went our separate ways. And I was like, I'm going to, I, I did, I ordered some, some cream and sent it to him because I want, that's something we can agree on, right? Knee pain, running, I mean, it's nothing to do with politics, but it is still a point where we can connect and recognize each other's humanity and have compassion for each other. And so that's what I focused on. And that's where I left it. Um, and I, you know, yeah. I, have a, I have a story in good chemistry about chatting with a guy at, at the, at my local grocery store, um, about, you know, groceries and recipes and what we're going to cook tonight. Um, and then when I walked out, my husband was like, did you see he was wearing an NRA hat? And I was like, no, I totally didn't see that, but mm-hmm. I'm glad mm-hmm. I didn't see it because if I had it, I wouldn't have chatted with him. You know, I would have been like, oh, I'm not going to talk to that guy. You know, he's not on my team. Um, you know, I hate guns. I hate gun violence. Um, it's ridiculous to me, the gun culture we have in America. But, uh, you know, there's a way to sort of subtly win over hearts and minds and, and have a conversation with somebody and get them to be open and connected. And then you very slowly start to teach them a little bit. Um, but you can't just come directly at somebody. They're going to feel like you're physically attacking them and they're going to shut down. Well, even this idea that we have sides, like it's, uh, it's not very humanist anyway yeah. or uh, animistic. or I mean, that's something that psychedelics are good at doing is yes. breaking down those barriers. Um, yes. I-, I wanted to ask you a bit about some psychedelic questions. Um, I was thinking about psychedelics, like the, the role of ceremony in it. And when I say ceremony, yeah. let's just call it like ritual or structure or yeah. really conscious intention as opposed to not. And the way we're bringing it into our society is through the medical model and we're researching it and getting approval to get legality. Like that's the doorway in. And I'm wondering like what the importance is, do you think of the role of ceremony or actually let's just call it the spiritual element, like the, right. the role that that spiritual journey plays in the effects people are having. It's not just chemical, like someone who decides not to use opiates after a strong journey or someone who's less anxious about death. I have a feeling that's not just a chemical thing going on. You know, they went through a journey. Um, yeah, there, I mean, yeah. There, there's a lot there to unpack. And I do, I do, um, I talk about ritual and I explain ritual and the pleasure of ritual and the comfort and safety that ritual provides. I talk about that in Good Chemistry because it's important. It's very pleasurable you know, to know, it's like to hear a story you already know, and you know, tell me the middle part again, and you know how it's going to end. And then they say the ending and there's something, you know, what's coming and then it comes. It's very uh, reassuring to have a structure and a ritual in place. Um, However, some of these medicines are going to work regardless um, of of whether they're, whether they're given in a sort of sacramental way, you know, with a structured ritual or whether they... Uh, or just are just handed over, you know, in a research setting. I mean, uh, for instance, at the Hopkins study, uh, you know, there, 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 there were no, you know, chanting or, or you know, sage or feathers. There's nothing like that. You know, there was just um, here is here is the psilocybin, and I, th- I think at NYU they did sort of put it in like a ceremonial goblet. I don't know if they did that at Hopkins or not. They might have used like a ceremonial. Well, Hop- goblet, Hopkins does like you but, know put lamps and they try to put up nice artwork. And yeah, you're on and a couch. The music, and- you know, the music really matters, and um, there's really um, uh, Mendel Kalin has has written some really great articles about how important yeah. the music is. Uh, and I don't have to tell you, East Forest, how important music yeah. is uh, to the ritual and how it can really transform somebody's experience. Um, but, you know, it's fair to say that there that there are some people who are uh, using using these medicines without much of a ritual. Um, and there are some people who maybe are drinking ayahuasca without listening to Icaros and th- they may still have an OK experience, you know. And um, there are some people who take MDMA at a rave and there are some people who take it with their lover and some people who take it with their friends. And they all have, uh, well, not, you know, I can't say 100% all, but most people tend to have pretty positive experiences um, in all these different settings. So there is absolutely an element of pharmacology that is undeniable. And then there are other elements of spirituality or mysticism, which are probably very helpful. And, you know, with the, with the Hopkins study, they really were able to say that 
the, the bigger the mystical experience, the higher the likelihood of behavior change. So it does seem to matter. And, you know, I know, like, for instance, with Ibogaine, that there, there are people trying to make sort of a version of Ibogaine that just resets the receptors, but doesn't give you, you know, the, the sort of I, the autobiographical, uh, you know, reset. 24 hour system. journey. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that you, that, you know, you just, uh, you don't get that component. And what will be very interesting is to to do some head-to-head comparisons and double-blind studies and say, uh, don't you need that? And yeah, I think you probably do need it. You know, for real behavior change, um, you need meaning. You need you need a disruption of the old meaning and an, an, an interjection of a new meaning uh, that you can really kind of glom onto. And you know, I've had so many patients, God, it's so exciting to have patients come to me who uh, aren't addicted to opiates anymore, or aren't addicted to alcohol anymore, or aren't addicted to cigarettes anymore, because of their experiences with ayahuasca, or with psilocybin, or with MDMA. Um, I love seeing that, you know, it's talk about disruptor. I mean, you know, these plant medicines and, and fungi, um, this is like a complete paradigm shift for psychiatry uh, <clears throat> that people can have a single experience or perhaps two or three experiences and make significant behavior change. Um, that's really that as opposed to the daily dose of medicines where you just are sort of mm-hmm. sweeping your symptoms under the carpet, but you're not really, you know, doing anything about your lumpy carpet. Yeah, I feel we're sort of in the domain of things that are deeply spiritual. And this is a word or even matters of the soul. Because when I say that, I'm saying it's sort of like matters of the heart, matters of like yeah. the tender parts of your consciousness beyond just the imbalances in your body. It's like a, a drug addiction could be a symptom of um, a deeper level of imbalance that Absolutely. I'm going to call a matter of the spo- soul or yeah. a spiritual thing. So yeah, I could look at our whole conundrum that we're in as a people or as a culture. I see it as a spiritual emergency. Yes. I don't mean that to say that Jesus needs to come down and do no. his thing. I'm saying right. like the Jesus is within you. It's like we, we actually are trying and actually to come from the outside in with solutions when the problem needs to come from the inside out, from the individual out. Yeah, I completely, completely agree. And the, and where we are right now as a culture is we, we really are at the sort of crossroads where we, we are having like a deep spiritual crisis. And um, it may be that the best sort of medicine, you know, for the spiritual dis-ease is you know, are these spirit medicines? So I, I definitely make the case in, in good chemistry that, 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 that is the situation, um, that we have gotten ourselves into a place where we really need these medicines, that we need them to reconnect with ourselves and to reconnect with our, with nature and with the planet and, and to sort of find our place in the cosmos. You know, the, um, part of a mystical experience or part of like a peak experience when you are, when you're tripping is this sense that like everything is connected and, and you are part of that everything. And therefore you are connected with everything and that everything is interdependent and that separation is an illusion, right? I mean, these are like sort of almost like trite truisms, like basic uh, tenets, you know, that you learn um, when you have a psychedelic experience. Um, but those, those truths can cause profound behavioral changes and also Absolutely. just a sense of, of hope and ease, you know, that, uh, that we're all in this together and that, you know, we all need to work together, but like, you know, to feel safe and held and cared for and looked after, imagine not feeling that, uh, from your mother or from yourself, but from the universe, you know, that's a good trip. Yeah. I mean, I, I grew up with a father. I love my father dearly. And I, but I, I also grew up with him and he's an atheist who I I guess, you know, believes that truly all this just kind of came to be. And here we are and it doesn't really have a meaning. It's beautiful. Like he's a naturalist, but he's right. But that would mean that like our connection and love is just chemical and it really doesn't have any meaning. And I rebelled against that feeling um, yeah. because it felt wrong and it also was painful. Like that's a kind of trauma. And I could recognize that even my interest today 
in matters of the spirit and everything that I do in this conversation we're having, the, the motivation behind it is from like this wound of feeling that I want to matter or that the universe shouldn't be meaningless. But it's not, see, that, that in itself is the sickness of what I perceive to be my father's sickness. Because when I've been in certain psychedelic states, which are felt experiences, you know, above all, it isn't an idea. It isn't a phrase. It isn't even a word. It's just a felt experience that I can't yeah. argue with yeah. about, no, that's not true. Actually, what is true is like, no matter where I go, no matter what choice I make, no matter where I fall, I'm never outside the thing. Call it one, call it God, call it the universe, call it love. It's just, there it is. And uh, what do you do with that? You, know, you come back and it's like, okay, I, it's like I went to the moon and here I am. It's like, I went to the moon. I remember it. It, was, right. it wasn't a dream. I remember it. It's like, right. and, and we each on an individual level then have to decide how we then take that into action where our, our feet hit the road. And right. It is a, that is to me, a, that's what I call a spiritual uh, thing. It's because it's, it's very personal. Yeah, you know, it's it's just you making those decisions. And that is what integration is all about, right? Is that you, you come back with these ideas, you know, this sort of sand in your hands, and then it sort of like runs through your fingers. Like you, you know, you come back with something uh, and some meaning and some message. And then the, the real work of integration is to, uh, you know, remember the message to sort of talk the, the, to walk the talk, you know, to, to put what you've learned into practice. And so that, you know, that does bring us back to politics. I'm sorry, but it does, you know, if you're going to have these, these psychedelic experiences where you realize like love is the answer and we're all connected and, and, you know, everything is everyone and separation is illusion and that's all great. And, you know, you've had this profound psychedelic experience, but then you know, you get on Facebook and it's, you know, Repub Repugnicans and, you know, <laughs> Cheeto and, you know, it's like, uh, where's all that love and unity, you know? So it is, it is really, um, uh, a challenge, you know, and the, and the, the ultimate sort of spiritual quest is to like, uh, you know, put your money where your mouth is and like, you know, what are you going to do with these, with these psychedelic tenets of, of like love and acceptance and, and compassion? Are you going to go out and be loving and compassionate? Um, I, that's what I would recommend. <laughs> and also that's really what's, you know, this word soul, um, you know, the, the, the subtitle of good chemistry is the science of connection from soul to psychedelics. And, I have to say that the the subtitle was not completely my idea. Um, I'm I don't use the word soul hardly ever, and I very very rarely use it in my office. But I found over the last few years, it just kept coming up. You know that I would say something like, "Well, you know, like not not like what do you do for fun, but like what nourishes you? You know, like what feeds your soul? You know." And and sometimes when I said soul, I would like put it in little little air quotes. You know, I'd I'd, oh, put, I'd put my fingers up. Yeah. You know, like lasers. <laughs> you know, like Doctor Evil. Like soul. You know, like it was like a weird word that I like. I'm sorry, I'm using this word because I know I'm a psychiatrist and I'm not a you know I'm not a priest, but. Um, but I have gotten more comfortable with, with just sort of throwing this word around that it's, you know, it's like, it's your essence, it's your presence. Um, but yes, we are searching for meaning. Um, if you don't have meaning, if, if life seems meaningless, or if you have no hope, um, you're going to get depressed and you might even get suicidal. And so it, it is true what you said that giving to other people and helping other people, it does give you meaning and it does feed your soul. And it does actually treat depression and treat anxiety for you to like go out in the world and, and be of use and be of service. And this is why, you know, it comes up in 12 step a lot. Oh, I don't mm -hmm. know what to do. I don't know what to do. And the answer is like, go be of service, you know, go help someone else. Um, and that also is actually one of the beautiful things about 12 step is that w once you get to a certain point in the process, you, um, you become a sponsor and you help somebody who's starting out. And like, you know, I, I have patients who, you know, different things work for different people, right? I mean, I have people who, uh, ayahuasca or ibogaine or psilocybin has helped them to end problematic relationships with drugs. But I have some patients who have found 12 step groups helpful. And th there is a lot of love and support in those rooms, I will say. Um, but, you know, they get kind of tired of it and they're like, I don't know what, what's the point? Why do I need to keep going? I'm, I'm sober. Why do I need to keep going? And I'm like, you have to keep going because 
when that new person shows up, there have to be people in the room, you know, like you have to keep, it's like a pyramid scheme. Like you have to keep it going. So more people come in and see that there's people who have been successful and like, okay, you don't need a meeting, but somebody else needs a meeting and they, and they can't go to an empty room and, you know, you can help and, and you want, you could share and say, Hey, you know, I've been sober 13 years. This is easy for me now. I don't even feel like I need to be here, but if anybody wants some help, come talk to me after the meeting. That's why you go yeah, to the yeah. it's a it's a practice too, and I think we have this notion that we're always going to a destination. You know, it's very American too, and it's it's like yeah. the, the pr- practice meaning like look, it doesn't have an end or a beginning. It's just sort of we're in process with things, and yeah. uh, even even what we're going through now, we're so hyper focused on the end, like the after we use the word after or the vaccine is like the savior yeah and it doesn't work that way (laughs) no i mean all of my patients you know when i was talking to them in like april and may and june they were all just like if i just knew when it would end it i could be okay like if you just said yeah we all could do this until (laughs) august or until november then then it would be okay and it's like you know first of all it's not true that it it would still be terrible it's just you'd know when it was gonna end but there but we do you know, we do like to know, uh, when things start, when they're going to end, how we, you know, we want to plan our vacations or whatever. And it's, yeah. you know, it's disrupting on a million different levels. And it's, yeah. you know, I spend uh, every day that I work with patients, I, I hear so many different perspectives on how challenging it is. And I, you know, I have parents who are having a hard time because their kids have moved back home. And then I've got kids who are having a hard time because they're moving back home with their parents. It's like, you know, I'm always hearing both sides or, um, I have a really interesting, this is a little bit off topic, but it's very, very interesting to me. Uh, a, a few of my patients are, are middle-aged women who are having a hard time because their children are, are, are becoming gender fluid or have always been gender fluid and are now sort of, you know, stating openly that they're gender fluid. And it's mm-hmm. really, really challenging for, for these, the mothers to sort of deal with their daughters or sons who are now their sons or their daughters. And it's like they, you know, they blame themselves. And, um, I, I love seeing things from different angles. You know, I have some transgender patients who are complaining about their parents and I'm like, well, you know, I've got some mothers and I understand, you know, it's like, I like seeing both sides. I, I, you know, it's very, it's very pleasant to me. And, and with this pandemic, um, I, I feel like I'm here, you know, I'm hearing from parents who, who absolutely do not want their kids to go back to school and parents who, if their kids don't go back to school, they're going to pull their hair out. You know, it's just, and, and it's my job to empathize and validate and support as, you know, as much as is conscionable, um, what my patients are saying, but a lot of them have different things to say. And it's really, it helps me to be sort of more accepting and more well-rounded that I can, I hear so many different perspectives. And I do think that, you know, my, my long history of, of, of trying uh, varied altered states and experiencing varied altered states really helps me with empathy with my patients. I mean, I, you know, when I was working at the psyche ER, like I don't have bipolar disorder, but I know what it's like to be hypomanic yeah, and right. and to feel like, you know, everything has meaning and everything is sparkly and connected. Like I get that, you know, and, and um, I don't have schizophrenia, but I know what paranoia feels like. I, you know, I know what delusions feel like. I had some very early uh, experiences with, with uh, PCP, not, uh, not sort of on purpose, let's say. Um, this oh, is, you know, easy. back, back in the seventies when, you know, sometimes you got LSD, PCP and some, was, sometimes yeah. you got, you slip, you you fall. Know, yeah. uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but because, but because of those experiences, I, I knew what it was like to be completely paranoid, to be referential, to think things, um, things were happening that I had to interpret and that everything was like a special sign or a special language I had to interpret. Like, you know, not everybody gets gets to have these experiences, but it really helped me to be a better psychiatrist because I know what it's like to be paranoid, um, to be disorganized, to, you know, to be reading into everything. So, um, I, you know, I wouldn't change a thing. You know, I, I had a, a, a funky childhood growing up in the, in the suburbs in the seventies. Um, and, you know, I had a little trauma here and there, whatever, but I, I would not change a thing because it, you know, the, the times I got hurt, I created scars that made me stronger, you know, and those, those scars and those wounds end up being really special sort of sacred, uh, parts of me 
that are actually uh, very well developed as opposed to underdeveloped, you know, because I had to, I had to get better to sort of overcome whatever happened. Well, that's good. That's a good analogy and reminder of the medicine and what we're going through collectively and all the different stresses we're facing now, uh, that there's always going to be, like, we're very adaptive as humans. And, you know, we have to step a little bit into our warrior energy here and say, yeah. like, I can do this. You know, we can do this. Um, we can do a lot of amazing things. We've been through some really terrible, shitty situations for all of humankind, like terrible terrible things yeah. have happened that we know about. And so it's like, we know we can do this and we have a lot of skills and there, are, there is a lot of division, but there's also so many people that are such good people right now, really wanting to take big risks and yeah. really see and do big change. It's out there. It's fully out there. It's not even like in the super far fringes. So it, it I don't expect like dramatic sea changes to happen overnight, but I, in some ways, the intensity and the speed of what's happening right now is a dramatic CG. It's like, this is how it happens. It's like it happens through collapse, and it is going to be painful. It's, yeah. it's, uh, it's like giving birth, you know, and it's, yeah. it's a messy, dirty, painful process, but it, it's beautiful. <laughs> right. It, <laughs> is, it, is, it is a big sort of birthing transformation. And, you know, and I honestly do think that this, that this sort of, you know, pus-filled abscess <laughs> when it comes to uh, our, you know, our nation has like, deep childhood wounding, right? Like our, our right. nation was founded on, you know, genocide and slavery and uh, terrible treatment of, of immigrants and, and immigrant labor. Um, mm -hmm. uh, America did a lot of bad things to a lot of people. Um, and then we just sort of tried to forget about it. And it's all, it's all coming bubbling up now, you know, and right. it's, it is time to pay the piper and it's time to, to, sort of be honest about uh, about our nation's founding and our and our childhood wounding and and try to do something to really uh, you know repair it um you know a, and I talk about reparations and good chemistry and and genocide and slavery I mean, you know there's uh all this pus is coming out <laughs> you know and it needs to it needs to come out we need you know it's so clear now the, the, the white supremacists and, you know, the racism and the misogyny, like it's so crystal clear now, it makes it easier to fight against if you can actually see it. So that's another silver lining, you know, that like, uh, you can't shoot at something if you can't see it, you know, and like now there are very clear targets of, you know, really kind of odious, offensive behavior that we can clearly see yet. Yes, this is a problem. A lot of people have been saying for a long time that this is a problem, and now nobody can deny that this really is happening. And so it makes it easier to fight it and tackle it if you can see it. You know, you can't, you can't, uh, I say this all the time, but like, you can't clean if you don't see where the dirt is, you know? Yeah, yeah, and, um, you know, it's like the, the purges, in a sense, are, are building. Yeah. And, uh, well, I mean, just could you could you tell us are there other ways that you explore in the book of points of connection? Because connection is kind of like sort of a overarching medicine, and we know what's difficult to do right now. Um, but we talked a bit about like psychedelics as a means of doing that, being of service, and all those different ways and what that means to be of service. We talked about like the golden rule and the idea of like giving the thing in any way that you wanting to engender yourself. Yeah. Um, what are what are other ways we can get our oxytocin on or feel connected, get into that parasympathetic state well, to walk through this time? You know, the first chapter is really all about just connecting with the self. And um, it starts with being embodied, just being in your body and not being sort of uh, distracted or constantly escaping. You know, you're always checking your phone. You're always on your laptop. Like just, just being present and being with yourself. Um, the whole first chapter I talk about ways that you can breathe, you know, just breathing through your nose or just in and out through your left nostril, that can really help you feel calm and connected and, and put you over in the parasympathetic. And whenever you're in parasympathetic, you're going to have more oxytocin. So uh, breathing through your nose, exhales longer than inhales, that helps keep you in parasympathetic. That's why chanting and singing um, can help so much because you're having these very long exhales. And, yeah, then, yeah. and then there's something called havening, where you, you sort of hug yourself and you stroke your arms from shoulder down to elbow. You just do this downward stroking from shoulder to elbow over and over again. Um, that can calm you and put you in parasympathetic. 
and uh, things like floating, you know, not just sensory deprivation tanks, but even just like floating in a hot tub or on a lake uh, or in a pool, uh, just having that sort of heart opening posture that can put you in parasympathetic. Yoga obviously is great for parasympathetic. What about saunas? um, I think saunas are good unless you, you know, it's really hard for you to be in a hot environment and it's making you stressed. But otherwise, Mm. yes, saunas definitely. um, We, uh, we have a friend group here and before COVID we were, we, uh, the women went on one Sunday and the men went on the next Sunday. And then if it was an equinox or a solstice, they would be co-ed. Um, and that, that sauna was good for so many reasons. Uh, I, I loved getting naked with my women friends and chatting. Um, and that, that was oxytocin, even if we were in a cold room, you know, but I do, I do think that saunas, um, can help to put you in parasympathetic. It's just, it has to be soothing for you. You know, you have to feel relaxed, but there's all kinds Mm -hmm. of tips, um, in good chemistry about how to, how to connect as a single person, um, you know, just on your own that you can give yourself oxytocin in certain ways. And then obviously with a partner, you know, the, the eye contact, the, the cuddling, um, skin to skin is really good for enhancing oxytocin and then, uh, sex and orgasm for sure, increase oxytocin. Um, and then childbirth, um, nursing, those are high oxytocin. Dog, dogs, dogs and pets, right? Dogs, you can yes. Get, I talk about this yeah. in the, in the nature yeah. chapter, um, that, you know, when you have eye contact, extended eye contact with the dog, the oxytocin rises in you and in the dog. And it's a, right. it's a little yeah. bit of like a cycle and, you know, people who have pets, um, they get that, you know, they intuitively get that, that they feel sort of safe and connected just with their pet, um, with their companions. So yeah, I, I wrote about that, I think in the, in chapter five. And then, so connecting with the earth, you know, just being like barefoot on the grass and feeling, you know, it's called grounding, but you feel very connected, uh, with the earth. I, I, I wrote about this in, in Moody Bitches. So my, my last book before Good Chemistry was, was called Moody Bitches, the the truth about the drugs you're taking, the sleep you're missing, the sex you're not having, and what's really making you crazy. And the last chapter was what's really making you crazy. And that chapter in Moody Bitches was all about disconnection, that the disconnection is the pathology and the disconnection is what is making us feel miserable and that we are disconnected from ourselves. We're disconnected from our families of origin, from the earth, from the planet, from the cosmos. You know, we are just uh, just on our devices and disconnected from everything. And And the devices, by the way, give you this sort of synthetic connection, this, this false sense that you are connected to your friends on Facebook or whoever you're emailing with. And, um, it's not quite what your body needs. Like your brain sort of feels connected. You're emailing people, you're texting people, you're going back and forth, you know, it's something, but it is not the true deep connection that you would get if it were skin to skin, eye to eye, if you're smelling somebody's pheromones and taking somebody in. And there's, there's this whole sort of, you know, aura or electromagnetic fields that people have, you know, I don't want to get too kind of, you know, crunchy granola, woo woo. But um, there are things that you do not get if you, if you are having a mediated experience through a screen um, that you do get if it is face to face, skin to skin. And, you know, unfortunately with COVID, we can't all uh, you know, we're more than ever, unfortunately, right now, we are we are resorting to that synthetic connection um, through our phones, through our laptops. And um, it's not giving us as much oxytocin as we would like. And, you know, it's uh, there's this great saying um, in addiction medicine, which is that you can never get enough of something that almost works, you know, and you're scratching around the itch, but you're not really scratching the itch. And so you, you think that quantity will make up for quality and you, we end up spending more and more time scrolling, 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 liking, loving, scrolling, liking, liking, caring, but, um, it's not real. It's synthetic. And so we never really get enough, you know, and, Mm -hmm. um, and we end up really getting addicted to our devices. You know, we keep going back, hoping maybe this time it'll be better. And maybe this time I'll really scratch the itch instead of just scratching around it. Or maybe if I scratch for an hour and a half, I'll finally feel some relief. Um, but we don't. And if yeah, anything, yeah. I would say we feel more disconnected and more terrible. You know, it's like if, if, if you're not anxious and demoralized and grieving, you're not paying attention, you know, things are pretty bad. And um, what's good though, is if I do stop, 
shut my laptop and leave my phone and go outside and I, and I'm in the woods or I'm by the swamp or I'm at the lake. Um, and it's just nature, you know, and clouds and trees and butterflies and water. I feel okay, you know, and it's not terrible and I'm, and I'm not grieving and I'm not scared. So I, you know, I, I totally acknowledge my privilege, you know, I'm privileged to be able to just walk away from, from the mayhem and go out in nature. But I will tell you, nature is, and I don't have to tell you, <laughs> like, you know, but uh, I will tell some of your listeners in case they don't know that nature and, and, you know, forest bathing and just being out in nature, that is the best antidote when you are feeling disconnected and demoralized and like everything is terrible and that, you know, the United States is a dumpster fire. It is true. But if you just go be with a tree and be with the grass and the, the hummingbirds and the blue jays and the butterflies and the dragonflies, um, you can forget that for a little while. And you remember that, you know, we are all on the planet together and we, and we are all one human species and all the species of the planet are interdependent. Um, and if you just sort of switch to earth time instead of, you know, Facebook, Twitter time, you will feel better. Well, as, as Ram Dass says, when you're hugging a tree, you're hugging yourself. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, that's, that's great. Yeah. There's a lot in here and there's a lot going on now. So I yeah. certainly appreciate you taking the time and, and digging into it. And, um, people can find the book wherever they find books and it's true. link to it <laughs> yeah yeah well thanks so much right. julie uh and how else do people connect with you well um it's very easy to find me online you know when i back in the 90s if i met somebody at a party and they'd be like how can i find you and i'd be like google julie ecstasy and you'll find me and i am very happy yeah. to report that still works <laughs> if you oh google, my god if you google julie wow. ecstasy you will find me very easily but my name is julie holland um, I have, my website is drholland.com, but, um, naturalmood.com, thepopbook.com, moodybitches.com. They all takes you to the same place. Man, you must get some wacky emails. I get well, wacky emails. You know, you must get unfortunately, some really one of my email systems is down right now. So what I am getting more is wacky, uh, voicemails <laughs> at the moment. Oh God. Okay. Um, but I, you know, I, it's really hard for me to help everybody. And a lot of people, you know, they they want uh they want to be referred for like underground work and you yeah, know I yeah. can't I can't yeah. just you know be giving can't referrals over the phone yeah. and telling people where to go I mean I, you know I really look forward to a time when more people can access the things that they want people want they want a microdose they want to take psilocybin they want MDMA assisted psychotherapy they want ayahuasca circles they want ibogaine I, people should be allowed to access these medicines they are effective. They are safe for the most part in people who are properly screened. And, um, you know, we need them. We absolutely need access to them. So um, anybody who is helping to sort of decriminalize nature and, and make these plant medicines more accessible, I thank you and I salute you. Oh, uh -oh. on that note, uh, thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you for interviewing me. Thanks so much, Julie, for coming on board. Always good. Look forward to having you back. This song that you're hearing in the background is Mind Karma from the Rambas album, Instrumentals, which features Sheila Bringy on the Bansuri flute. And she is such a badass Bansuri player. Uh, she's doing a track on this new studio record, too, coming out in the winter. So I hope you enjoy the Ramdas Instrumentals. Coming out September 18th, 2020 on all listening platforms. This is a digital release, so you can get it wherever you listen to music. And, uh, yeah, guys, you keep doing your thing. Um, I'll keep doing these podcasts as long as I'm able. Thanks for the words of support and the reviews. And uh, we'll keep singing each other awake. You keep walking that walk. Don't take any shit. But if you do, do it with grace.
Thank you.